Aloha Awinala, I'm Kaweem, Lucas host of Hawaii is my main lab, focused on the bright side and off the grid, live streaming every Friday at 3 p.m. Unless you have been living under a rock, you will have heard of the decision last month by the Department of Army not to grant the easement under late Oahe to build the Dakota Access oil pipeline in Standing Rock, North Dakota. Andre Perez, originally from Koloa, Kauai, he currently read, resides on Oahu, where he engages in community activism and organizing around social justice. His community work centers on Hawaiian sovereignty and self-determination. His academic research focuses on Hawaiian religion and traditional practices. Andre made two trips to Standing Rock recently, North Dakota, uh, um, one in October, and one last month to assist with non-direct, non-violent direct action training. Vilina. Aloha. <laughs> well, after lots of pits and starts, here we are finally. And I have been dying to talk to you for months, actually. I had such a great time talking to your partner, Camille, uh, about Mauna Kea, and it seems just beautiful right. to have you here talking about North Dakota. Well, so. Yeah, mahalo. I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to, to share the experience with you and, and everyone. Uh, so um, give us um, the background of how you got involved and and, and what you did there? Um, I really got involved um, via pre relationships, you know, and activist relationships. So um, a couple of years ago, I had um, attended uh, this um, direct action training with um, the Indigenous Peoples Power Project. And um, as, um, as Standing Rock began to unfold, you know, of course, many of us were following it on Facebook and, and you know, other forms of news. And um, I noticed that <clears throat> a lot of people that I knew from um, indigenous activist circles in, in America, on the continent, were there. And I came across a name that was the um, point of contact for Red Warrior Camp. And I was like, hey, I know this person. So um, a friend of mine, Crystal Rain Tubles, I gave her a call and said, hey, you know, we were thinking about coming up, but we want to, um, this is the first trip in October, uh, me and Camille, we wanted to go up to sort of reciprocate that support that came to um, Hawaii, um, to Mauna Kea, ah. with, uh, you know, Native yeah. American brothers and sisters, and, of course, and people from Aotearoa, many people came. So, you know, we don't want to be sort of, you know, Hawaii-centric in our, in our solidarity. We want to sort of reciprocate that. So we felt compelled to go, but we wanted to go with a purpose and to bring something that we thought would, would be helpful. So um, we have a picture of you and Camille from that up October trip. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there you are. Yep, this is us at, uh, at the Ocheti Shakoin um, camp in um, mid October. So, what was going on and what did you guys do? So, that first trip, we uh, you know, we went there, um, we coordinated uh, our trip directly with Red Warrior Camp, because that's who we had contacts with, and I knew a few people that were there. Um, and we went to help um, um, bring a component um, to kind of help bolster their direct action. And here in Hawaii, in Mauna Kea, Camille has done trainings for legal observers, and legal observers are um, these uh, designated folks who monitor arrests and they document arrests. And they make sure that if people's rights are being violated or if the arrests are aggressive and people get injured during arrest, that it's documented. And it also serves as a, a tactic to kind of keep the police on notice that they are being monitored and you know, that everything's being documented. And it sounds like um, there was plenty to document. We have a picture of the, of the vehicles. Um, what, was, what was going on with that? Um, well, these vehicles I took pictures of on, the, on my second trip in December, but these are the are vehicles that were just outside the, uh, that infamous bridge on, uh, on the 1806 uh, highway. And these vehicles are the result of uh, direct action confrontations with the police. And later the police had used the vehicles to blockade the road and to cut off access to the, to the camp and to try to hobble them 
by cutting off access and making it more difficult for people to get in and out. So the, what was the, were you witness to any of the direct actions? Um, yeah, so, in, so in, in, uh, in the October trip, we went there actually for, to help with legal observer training, and that kind of didn't pan out the way we had planned. So, as, as yeah, right. often happens. So, but you know, we, we, um, we're activists and we believe in nonviolent direct action. And so we just plugged right into Red Warrior Camp and um, participated in a direct action planning. And this was the one that happened on Indigenous Peoples Day, also known as Columbus Day, um, in their narrative, the other side. Um, and uh, that was, I think it was October 10th. So we participated in the planning of a direct action, which was a ceremony on the pipeline and the erecting of a teepee. Um, and we were right in the mix on that and um, um, right on the front line. And, and you know, with, with the police, I think over 20 people got arrested and the police came in force. Um, Camille did function as a legal observer in her own capacity for that action. And she had a few other people with her that she had trained. But I mean, we were right in the mix on that particular action, and and you know, we, you know, what was that felt like? the tension. Yeah, what was that like? I mean, it was it was intense. You know, um, there was a lot of police. They came armed with weapons, shotguns, and rifles, and um, a whole squad of police with batons. Um, the there was tension with the people, as can be expected. You know, a lot of shouting, chanting, singing, um, but. There's no question that it was always peaceful, you know. Yeah, there's, there's shouting, there's yelling, you know, there's chanting. But uh, the, the people uh, demonstrated a lot of discipline. And um, it was an experience for us to see that level of police mobilization. There were helicopters and airplanes, you know. There were a lot of police. And there was a tense standoff and, and a lot of people got arrested. So how did you avoid getting arrested? Um, <laughs> I just basically was conscious of where the police were and paying attention to what they were doing and, and knowing where the boundaries were between public and private property. Ah. And I wasn't adverse at that. I, w I really wasn't adverse to getting arrested if it was necessary to support the cause, you know, to, to um, put a body on the line. Um, but I was also conscious that being a person from Hawaii, getting arrested yeah. would entail a lot more logistics afterwards, right. you know, coming back for subsequent court cases. So I guess my position was, if it was necessary, I wasn't adverse to it, but I wasn't going to throw myself on the sword unnecessarily. No, we're grateful. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, I just knew where the boundaries were and, and, and kind of kept off the boundaries. Although uh, there's a lot of coordination um, when it comes down to this. this so is how not... did that happen, the coordination? It was fascinating. I heard uh, or read that you, every day at 2 o'clock you, you did a training. We have some, we have some pictures of that. So, so, so this, who coordinated? This organization that, uh, that, I, was, um, that I was working with, um, that I was there for on the second trip, the Indigenous Peoples Power Project, um, they're a network of native indigenous activists from across, across the, the continent, you know, and, and Canada. And they're a network of trainers. So they, this is kind of what they do. They come in and they help train nonviolent direct action and they help strategize direct actions. So they were there at the camp um, from September, n near the beginning, at the request of the tribe. And they were there to, prov and this is the part that I saw that was very organized. So they had a kuleana, they had a specific function. Their job there was to train all newcomers in uh, nonviolent direct action orientation. So, um, you know, the trainers were cycling in and out. And, and in October, after my first trip, I got a call back and said, hey, we need another trainer. Do you want to come and help us do the trainings? Yeah, they're every day at 2 o'clock, and it can be anyone from... Is that what we're looking at? Then? That's what we're looking at right now. Um, this is, like, I think my second week there after it started to snow, but anywhere from 50 to 300 people on each day, it fluctuated, sometimes 75, sometimes 100, 200. Wow. But, you know, um, to me, a very important component of um, the Ocheti Shako in camp was that there was training requirements. People had to go to a camp orientation. They had to go to nonviolent direct action training. And I think that's what kept 
uh, the discipline. Here we see, um, this is training that we did on soft blockades, human blockades, in the event that we need to hold space and protect elders, protect people who are in ceremony, or just kind of um, hold the police, hold space against the police. Uh, we did training on um, nonviolent soft blockades, you know, where people lock arms in formation. And then I'm seeing a lot of flags around. Um, what was that? So all the flags um, are represent really all the different nations and tribes um, um, that support, that came and who stand in solidarity with um, the Standing Sioux tribe and, and the water protectors. So there's hundreds of tribes from, Nat uh, hundreds of flags representing Native American tribes, but there's also flags, of course, from Hawaii, from Aotearoa, um, from other countries that, that came to support or people from, you know, who represented. So, um, and, and who is this? So these are members of um, Indigenous Peoples Power Project. This is uh, our training um, tent. So we had this tent set up in a field and it's where we did our two o'clock nonviolent direct action training, but it only had a capacity of about 50 people. So more than half the time we were out in the field in the snow because <laughs> it just couldn't, uh, just couldn't hold so capacity. It, it, it seems remarkable uh, that, you, that so many people, I mean, how many people were there? when you were there in the summer? So when I got there, it was uh, Thanksgiving weekend. So a lot of people came out um, for that just because of the three-day weekend. Uh -huh. So when I got there, the first time I got there, I would say there was about maybe 1,500 to 2,000 people back in October. And it fluctuated off, off and on, off and on. But when I got there for uh, Thanksgiving weekend, or so-called Thanksgiving, um, I think there was about 4,000 people. And I thought that was huge. It was huge. Um, it was, you know, more than double than what I had seen. And then the following weekend was the weekend when all the vets came in. And that ballooned upwards of around, the estimates are twelve to 14,000 people. Were you there when? Oh, yeah. I was there for, for that entire uh, uh, episode. And, and Tulsi, were you there for her? I was there when Tulsi came. And, and, um, How and was that? some people may have seen we had a little... Um, um, Disagreement, maybe. You know, it was it was cordial, but um, you know, I, I respect that she made the effort to come. You know, um, I'm sure that she was motivated to come because a lot of vets came, and it became this kind of vet solidarity thing. Um, but you know, I was also conscious as a person from Hawaii, you know, um, engaged in Hawaiian issues. Um, I was conscious that, you know, I don't see her really taking strong stances on Hawaiian issues. Okay, so is that what the dis disagreement was about? We're about to go to a break, but let's, let's um, talk about that a little bit. Okay. Okay, well, let's take a break now then and come back and talk about it more because that's right. a pretty good subject. <laughs> Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays. 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stand the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 o'clock, and my gig is energy efficiency, doing more with less. It's the most cost-effective way that we in Hawaii are going to achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2045. I look forward to being with you. Aloha. Perez, who was part of the training crew at, at Standing Rock. And um, we were just talking about uh, the weekend that the vets came and Tulsi was there and you had a little discussion. Yeah, you know, a little. Um, I mean, I just basically spoke up to correct some misinformation that she was putting out. And I don't know that it was intentional or malicious, but um, 
more important than that was it was important that I cor corrected her with the facts. So what does she know now that she didn't know? Um, well, she was asked a question by a Native American man and, um, about Hawaii. And I found out later, his name was Charlie, that he had met other Hawaiians who had come to Standing Rock, in particular Sam Kelly Ho'omalu from Kalapana. And so he was aware of Mauna Kea. And so he asked her, what about Hawaii? What's going on with Mauna Kea? And she replied, essentially, that issue has been resolved. They're taking the TMT to the Canary Islands. And so I was there in, in the group, you know, this group of about 300 vets, and there was a lot of media. And that wasn't, that wasn't factual, you know. And, and I don't know if it was intentional or not. I, I, I'd like to hope not. But I just said, hey, that's not exactly true. You know, I was, I'm from Hawaii. You know, I'm Kanaka. I was on that mountain and got arrested. I'm involved in that struggle to a certain degree. And um, it's not over. They're still trying to get a permit to build on Mauna Kea. It's not resolved. And in fact, we're in the middle of contested case hearings in Hawaii right now for right the permit. Now. Yeah. And so she, you know, she acknowledged that. She stood corrected and um, thanked me. You know, and then later I, you know, I, I, I talked to her about it. And I just said it's important that we put out correct information. And she agreed. Yeah. So, you know, okay. that good was enough. that. Like you say, it's pretty good that she showed up. I was pretty happy that she mentioned the uh, Red Hill fuel tanks, which is a big deal for me. Right. And, you know, at least she, you know, gave voice to that in, in the context of being water protectors. Right. I think the big thing, though, that a lot of, especially Hawaiians, um, who are struggling with the similar issues, water rights, burial protections, sacred sites, that we, you know, if she's going to go to North Dakota to stand for those things, we would hope uh, that she's going to do the same here. It's not unreasonable to expect that from our state. Very, Congress very good from, point. I right. will add she was at the last meeting um, about the Red Hill fuel tanks, and she didn't make any press or do anything because she came a little bit late, but right. she did show up. Right. So, um, thanks for keeping her on the <laughs> <laughs> on point. <laughs> on one point. <laughs> so, um, this is one of the biggest. Uh, oh, I, I read it. What it, the Standing Rock is the biggest gathering of native tribes um, in the history of or modern history. Yeah. Yeah. So, w what was it like with all of those different um, tribes, and how do they seem to be? They're, they seem to be pretty good at uh, coming together. I think that they were, I mean, it, they're not without their own struggles and strife, you know, and disagreements, but they instituted something very important. They set a tone. They set a set of principles that the camp, um, when as soon as you drive into the camp, you see this big board that has the principles. And that was part of our training as well. But the principles really set the foundation for what what people are there for and what they're you know how they how they carry so, themselves. So let's have an example. So some of the, the um, some of the key principles are that you know we're here to protect water, we're here to stop the pipeline, we're here for ceremony and prayer, um, we respect local leadership. Um, um, there was a principle about <clears throat> um, dealing with. Isms, racism, chauvinism, sexism, you know, patriarchy, which I thought was really progressive. And, and I heard it time and time again that women um, are part of the process and decision making process and need to be, that standard needs to be upheld and respected and that not just men. You know, we think of chiefs and tribal councils and, you know, the, the visual is always men um, calling the shots. Well, they were very conscious and good about um, um, sort of kind of tearing down some of those. Um, um, processes, you know, that are kind of male-centric. So I, I was impressed by, you know, how um, these foundational principles kept people on point. And, and, and people would remind each other, we're here for the water. That's what we're here for. And there, the, it really was successful to have, I mean, the idea of 7,000 or 8,000 people camping in a <clears> place that is not set up for that is, is, is pretty staggering, but they were able to keep order um, without the authorities and... I think so. I mean... That's, that's gorgeous. That's you know, awesome. I, you know, I mean, you know, sometimes 
uh, indigenous, native, whatever you want to call us, you know, we get stigmatized. Um, there was a lot of order. There was um, extremely well-organized medical care. So there was a, a medic camp that had MD doctors in one um, tent. There was naturopathic herbal doctors in another one. There was um, a chiropractor and a bunch of lomi lomi masseuses. Oh, wow. Um, there was a mental health kind of emotional trauma care tent you could go. People, you know, a lot of emotions. Um, they were always um, organized and always on duty 24-7. I kind of felt like you could get better health care at that camp than <laughs> on the street anywhere else in the U.S., you know. Wow. Um, but there was security that was on camp 24-7, so entry and exit. So was security was not, was, was self-security? Yeah, I mean, self-organized. By the tribes and not by the officials. No, yeah, self-organized uh, volunteers. A lot of them were Native American vets um, who, you know, had who, military it, background. I, I never heard anybody say, well, so how was the chain of command? I mean, how, how did you guys figure that out? Um, I wasn't, you know, I, I, I can tell you my perspective, yeah. but I think it changed over time. The chain mm -hmm. of command, you know, was sort of dynamic, but I think one of the critical things that I, I just saw happen was the, the Ocheti Shakoin, um, that, that name is the name of the seven, the seven tribes, you know, the, um, that make up the, the, the regional Lakota and Lakota and Dakota. And it's an old name that talks about their kind of unification, I guess. And so they had a ceremony, and in that ceremony, they, they identified headsmen that would represent each tribe. So seven headsmen, and I think there was some like alternate headsmen. And, and there was, it, there was um, not always agreement, but um, I think there was a big push to kind of recognize these seven headsmen who would take leadership and responsibility for the camp and be responsible for security, and be responsible for um, that's a lot sanctioning direct actions. Wow. And then, of course, there was the tribe, the tribal council, um, the Standing Rock Council, and, and and you know, I mean, we're all human. There wasn't always agreement, and there wasn't always things happening on the same page. But at the end of the day, I mean, the the conduct, the mannerisms, was there, like aloha aina. Um, you know, for love of the land, for love of the water, people helped each other, people got along. Um, so, you know, I don't think there was anything that takes away from the real purpose and struggle. You know, you um, were, I was so grateful that you were posting so prolifically. Well, not prolifically <laughs> enough, actually, but that there was, we would get these little snippets from time to time on on. on on yeah. Facebook, principally through the, uh, I saw it through the Aha Aloha Aina site. And um, I felt it was so inspiring for us back here to see mm -hmm. how inclusive it was. You mentioned the women and, mm -hmm. it, and you know, taking a look at the par mm -hmm. patriarchy and having uh, natural medicines. And mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm sorry that a lot of the visuals didn't work out. There was, I've seen beautiful pictures of, of how the medicines were done. Mm -hmm. Um, but you also had uh, pictures of the the um, the art that there was yeah. an art tent, right. and um, we're gonna show that that video that you made. Okay. Okay. Yeah, isn't that one cool? That's mine. My jacket. It's cool. Can you give me a quick narrative? What's going on here? Okay, what's going on is that this is the art that's help supporting the front line. So anybody that's on the front line and and going and doing things and being productive and prayerful and mindful, this is all the stuff that we make. We make these patches and then. On alternative days, what we do is we open it up so other people from around camp can bring their t-shirts in, look at these baby onesies in, so that way they can show their support wherever it is that they can. And, you know, honoring the honoring the sacred and making sure that they get the word out and, you know, showing off the beautiful art and the amazing artists 
that are helping to make this possible. And all of the art is being um, sanctioned. They're, they're approved by the youth council and the elders. And, and that so that way we know that whatever is on the screen is getting printed is appropriate right. for the area and, and for what we're asking. And can you tell me your name and where you're from? My name is Lucretia James and I'm tonight from Northern BC. Sin means origin and Ike means bullhead trout. And so we were considered extinct in 1956. And so I'm down here in the U.S. And we're, my father's side is um, the Colville tribal, but up in BC, we're not, we're not actually alive anymore. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. All right. So in the last couple of minutes, Andre, um, tell us what it really meant for you. Well, I mean, for me, it meant, you know, one, expressing solidarity, you know, and we're, we're not going to solve our issues by ourselves here in Hawaii, you know, as my good friend uh, Kalikwa says, Hawaii won't be free until the Pacific is free, right? None of us are free if one of us is chained. So it was important to go there and express that solidarity and, and to help, but also um, to bring back that experience, that kind of activism. Um, I don't think that we've really um, have that level of nonviolent direct action training, and I'm hoping to um, sort of bring back that experience and you know, it's kind of introduce um, the training and, and level of organizing and activism that I've seen there here for our issues. I think it's important. Yes. Um, so, uh, is that in the works? Um, I'm working on a few things. Um, I got a few training trips planned out. I have something on the back burner that I'm looking to establish. And and you said your um, your your institute or the. I'm looking to establish the Hawaii Unity and Liberation Institute as a, as a training org um, for this kind of activism and training. Yeah. And that, that incorporates not just nonviolent direct action, but also the art component. You know, art being you know, so important to messaging and narrative you know, and political expression. Absolutely. Yeah. That is so often left out, at least in the Western world, and it was just inspiring to see how integrated it was uh, at Standing Rock. Standing Rock is a shining example of how they, they used art. You know, I mean, they had the whole tent dedicated. Um, Indigenous People's Power Project created the action art tent or the art action tent and just artists pumping out silkscreen prints all day. Okay, so in the next uh, Big Sovereignty, maybe La Kuokoa or something, are we going to have an art tent? I'm hoping to, to, it's something that we're working on. Oh, thank you so much for coming over, Andre, Mahalo. and talking to Mahalo us. Nui. Aloha. Aloha.